الحمد لله مالك الملك مجري الفلك مسخر الرياح فالق الاصباح ديان الدين رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أمين الله على وحيه وعزائم أمره الخاتم لما سبق والفاتح لما استقبل والمهيمن على ذلك كله وعلى أهل بيته شجرة النبوة وموضع الرسالة ومختلف الملائكة ومعدن العلم وأهل بيت الوحي صلى الله عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي وابن سيدي يا أبا عبد الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي يا أبا الفضل العباس السلام على الشفاه الذابلات السلام على الجسم السليم السلام على يا 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 الخد التريب يا عبرة كل مؤمن يا 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 ومؤمن يا يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة يا غريب يا مظلوم كربلاء يا ليتنا كنا معكم سيدي فنفوز فوزا عظيما Enlighten your hearts and minds with a loud salat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. <laughs> I need to express my condolences to Sayyidi wa Mawlai al Imam al Hajjah. May Allah hasten his reappearance on this very sad night. This night which is reserved and dedicated to Sayyidi wa Mawlai Abi al-Fadl al-Abbas ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib, peace be upon him. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this very night to bless our hearts, to have sincere intentions towards Abi Abdullah al-Hussein wa Abi al-Fadl al-Abbas in order for us to understand the words of Allah, the word of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon him. And all this is with a blessed salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. When speaking about Abil Fadl al Abbas, we're speaking about an infallible scholar of Ahlul Bayt. When speaking about Abil Fadl al Abbas, we're speaking about the champion of Karbala. When we're speaking about Abil Fadl al Abbas, peace be upon him, we are speaking about the prominent figure of Ashura, the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Now when it comes to examine the biography of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, khutaba and speakers tend to basically examine the life in Karbala itself. Inshallah ta'ala, in these several minutes that we're going to have today, and basically we're going through a brief biography to derive some lessons from 
that prominent figure Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas والسلام, since the tragedy of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas will take a little longer than the other tragedies that we recited of Ahlul Bayt peace be upon him. So we'll go through uh, briefly basically through some uh, aspects inshaAllah ta'ala. And we are going to examine the life of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, the beginning of his life. His childhood, when he was born, Ruhi Lahul Fida. After the martyrdom of the Lady Fatima, Sayyida Tunisa Al Alameen, alayha of Salatu was Salam. Amir al Mu'mineen, peace be upon him, the commander of faithful, decided to remarry. He went to his brother Aqil ibn Abi Talib, and Aqil that time used to have a carpet laid down he carries his own carpet or an let's call it an area rug he lays down this area rug in one corner of the Prophet's mosque Masjid al-Nabawi and people used to gather around him they used to call him Al-Arifu bi ansab al-Arab the one who's the expert of the lineage of the Arab so people used to come and consult him. He's a counselor, he's a marriage counselor. Muslim, or basically Aqil ibn Abi Talib, alayhi salam, peace be upon him. Aqil, Amir al-Mu'mineen approached Aqil. He tells him, Ya Aqil, I need to get remarried. And I need, to f I need you to find me a woman. He told him, yes, for sure. Can you tell me what kind of standards, what kind of qualities you need in that woman? Amir al-Mu'mineen says, أريد امرأة ولدتها الفحولة من العرب I need to basically, I need you to find me a woman that comes from a family which is known by its courage and bravery. Aqil told him, you're marrying a man, you're, I'm sorry, often. you're marrying a woman and you're looking for these kind of virtues? Usually, you don't look when you come forth to marry. You don't look like the, the courage is not within the virtues that you have to look when it comes to marry a woman. That does not mean that women are not courageous. But definitely it's not one of the priorities when a man wants to propose to a woman, he doesn't check out if she's brave or not. Amir al-Mu'mineen had a purpose, alayhi wa salatu wa salam. So he said, no. Read umra'atan waladatha al-fuhulatu min al-Arab. He told him, okay. Aqil comes back to Amir al-Mu'mineen, told him, told him, I have Fatima al-Kilabiyya, which is also known as Umm al the mother of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi afdhul salati wa salam. Now before Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi afdhul salati wa salam goes and proposes prop propose, sorry, to Umm al she sees a beautiful dream. She sees that a great man is coming to propose to her. And then she sees that the moon is descending from the sky into her lap. Subhanallah. So she goes and asks her mom, I saw this. What do you say? She's like, You will marry a great man, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant you with a son. It's so handsome to an extent that he resembles the moon. Al Abbas ibn Abi Talib alayhi wa salatu wa Narration states that Al Abbas was handsome to a level that. They say in Arabic, كانت تزدحم أزقة المدينة إذا مر العباس بها. Allah. When there's a crowd in the neighborhoods of the Medina, they used to say that, what's going on? They used to say, لقد مر العباس. Abbas ibn Abi Talib has just passed through. Narration states, Abbas and Ali al-Akbar, عليه أفضل الصلاة والسلام. He resembles the moon, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. قمر بني هاشم روح له الفداء. And then, brothers and sisters, Amir al muminin proposed, and then they got married. Amir al muminin enters to his bride. 
What's beautiful here is that Amir al-Mu'mineen, as soon as he sees Umm al-Baneen, he saw a beautiful woman, an incredibly beautiful woman, subhanAllah. That he basically was not looking for a beautiful woman. And look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted him. As he saw the outer beauty, let's say the external beauty of Umm al-Baneen, he wanted to test the inner beauty, which is most important. For those who inshallah are willing to get married, the inner beauty. We're going to touch on this inshallah ta'ala very briefly. He tells her, Ya Umm al Baneen, do you want to say anything? Do you want to tell me anything? She said, Ya Fatima, sorry, Ya Fatima. He called her on her first name. Do you want to tell me anything? She's like, Yes, Ya Amir al When you address me, when you speak to me, don't call me Fatima. She's like, How come? Fatima is the best of the names. It's like, no, I don't need you to call me Fatima. Because I know that the mother of your orphans is Fatima, Sayyidat Nusa al Alami. And as soon as you mention my name, they were gonna remember that name. And they will probably feel grief and they will shed tears. So I don't need you. SubhanAllah. Fatima al Kilabi, Umm al Bani, Alayhi Abdul And then. On the 23rd after Hijra, the 4th of Sha'ban, Amir al-Mu'mineen was sitting in the Holy Mass, where Qambar came to Amir al-Mu'mineen telling him, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted you a son. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Amir al-Mu'mineen got delighted, he got happy. He went back to the his home, and he saw Abu Fadl Abbas He embraced him, and he started looking at his hands, flipping these blessed hands, these palms. Narration states that he starts shedding tears and crying. Zainab salam tells him, "Aba asamaytahu? Did you name him yet?" Like yes, ya Aba, ismuhu al Abbas. وَكُنْيَتُهُ أَبُوا الْفَضْلِ And his title is As-Saqi. She told him, why is he called As-Saqi? She's like, Ya Zainab, I need to ask the sisters please to calm down a little bit so we can basically go through our points inshaAllah ta'ala. So I ask you to maybe recite a salat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. It's like, Ya Zainab, a day will come, a difficult day will come. And Al-Abbas والسلام, will have the mission of grabbing the water and offering the water for you when you're thirsty on the plains of Karbala. That's why he's called As-Saqi, Ya Zainab. Now, we have a couple of aspects that we need to shed light on. How can we derive lessons from this beautiful incident? Number one, Amir al Mu'mineen, what Rasulullah says, Ana Madina tul ilmi wa aliyun babuha. I am the city of knowledge, and Ali ibn Abi Talib, its gates. Faman arad al Madina, al yatiha min babiha. Whoever wants to enter that city of knowledge, so go through who? Ali ibn Abi Talib. And he's the one who says, Saluni qabla an tafkuduni, fa ana al alim. Allah. He is the knowledge. He's the knowledge itself. He's the incarnate of knowledge, Amir al Mu'min. Question is why did Amir al Mu'minin, alayhi afdhul salati wa salam, had to go to Aqil to seek an advice when, it's, when it comes to marriage? That's a beautiful lesson, brother and sister. Amir al Mu'minin is telling us that when you need to get married, when you need to propose to a woman, seek advice. Go to the experts and do not basically seize on your opinion without asking others about other people. Definitely you have a bigger brother, let's say, that he has more experience. Ask him. Tell him, can you tell me what's the best way and what are the best of women? And for you, sister, when you come to marry, 
When you come to accept or not that proposal, ask. There's no rush, there's no harm to ask and seek advice. The narration states, Man is halak. One who basically sees on his opinion will fail eventually. And the other narration states that Man rijal, fi Beautiful. Whoever basically seeks advice, he's in a state of borrowing an intellect. SubhanAllah. We have one intellect, right? How beautiful it is when you have four, five, six, ten intellect joined together to make a decision. You're borrowing that intellect. You're using an intellect. Now, being stubborn for a level that as soon as you have a crush on a spouse, let's say, addressing both men and women, when you have a crush, you're interested in him. Hey, you saw him, beautiful. Is that enough to determine that this is the man or this is the lady that I'm going to continue my life with? This is not enough. That will basically, what they say, that will basically lead to divorce. And the most of cases of divorce happen in the period of engagement because there's not enough time to get to know your spouse because you basically rush. Now, when it comes to decide, take your time. There's no rush. Ask. Seek advice. And the best people, brothers and sisters, to seek advice from are our parents. Why? Because they need the full benefit of you. We are basically an investment of our parents. They sacrifice our life towards our life. They take from their health and put into our health to see us grow up and establish a successful institution of a marriage. They don't want us to, they don't want to see us failing. Now, some may say, basically we're not meaning that they have the direct impact or the direct decision, not at all. We explained yesterday how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevated the status of a woman in Islam to a level that she has the say in marriage. Okay? And we said basically, explicitly, that when that lady came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam Khatamul Anbiya Muhammad For mentioning his name please recite the salat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad And she came to him and told him I don't, I need, I don't need to marry I don't need to marry that man He told her but Your parents Basically want you to marry that man. She said, I don't need him. I know stuff that I don't need. I seriously don't need to marry that He says that to Zawajir. Even though for men, our parents don't have the basic ultimate decision. We are the one, even women, you are the ones to have the ultimate decision. But take your time. Take your, you, are, you and your husband are the main characters of that institution, right? Take your time to make that decision. No rush. As soon as you feel crush towards that person, you just make your mind you want to live your life with them. How come? And you say that I'm in love. Now let me tell you one thing. You did not understand love. You did not reach any, any state of level of love. Or mawadda. That the Quran speaks about. Ja'ala baynakum mawaddatan rahma. There's mawadda which we shed a little light on it first night. So I'm not sure if you guys remember or not. We spoke about the mawadda. Mawadda that the Quran is speaking that should be the main characteristics when it comes to the marriage institution is to have mawadda. Mawadda is loving inside and then basically showing practical steps towards that love, right? Not because I just liked him, I get obsessed. And I cannot sleep my night waiting at least just for a text message so I can sleep afterwards. No, no, no. 
This is not Islam, brothers and sisters. Take your time. There's no rush. Now, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi afdhul salati wa salam, Aqeel asked him back, telling him that, can I ask why do you want to encourage a courageous woman? He says, لِأُرْزَقَ مِنْهَا بِوَلَدٍ أَدَّخِرُهُ لِيَوْمِ الشِّدَّةِ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can grant me with a son. That could be some sort of an investment to me on a difficult day. Like Karbala. Amir al is thinking 40, 40 years ahead. Subhanallah. Now, he had standards. He had qualities. When it comes to marriage, brothers and sisters, let's have qualities. Now, beside the famous hadith that says, Man ja'akum, iza ja'akum, sorry, man tarzawna deenahu wa khuluqahu fazawwijuh. How beautiful is that Rasulullah is prescribing? Explicitly stating that the characteristics of a spouse should be what? Religious and have akhlaq, manners, ethics. SubhanAllah. Now besides that, why don't we bring a list for those who inshaAllah who are basically uh, planning to marry because nobody can go across marriage. Everybody. If it's not right now, everybody thinks about marriage brothers and sisters. If it's not right now, afterwards. And for the fact, I know that, especially women, everybody, <coughs> females, basically, they, they dream about their wedding, right? They dream about the dress of the wedding, they dream about the cake, they dream about all the basic, uh, what's called, rituals of the marriage, right? Even men, men are obsessed of having a family, having kids, living with a partner of life, helping her, helping him. Now, everybody thinks about marriage. If it's not now, inshallah, later on. But when it comes to marriage, bring a list. I went, when I decided to marry, that was Mary, sorry, that was three, four years ago. I went to Tahran, a scholar in Tahran, a alim. He told me, have a list and write your standards. What are you searching for? Besides the akhlaq and the religion, have some sort of qualities. Amir al had a purpose, right? He wanted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant him with a courageous son. That's why he looked for what? Bravery and courage. Now, if you know what you need, look for these standards. And he recommended something very beautiful. He told me, Look at the level of the intelligence of your wife. And for you as well, sisters, look at the level of intelligence of your spouse. Why? Because when you understand, when you are smart, basically, when a mu'min is using his intellect, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made this whole world best of creation was the intellect, after creating that aql, that intellect, he told him, come forth, he came. He told him, go backwards, he went backwards. Meaning of uh, giving him command, he obeyed. It's like, through you I will reward and I will punish. Now, when you have an intellect, okay, when you use that intellect, and when your spouse has an intellect, how beautiful is that? You will both reach, you will both arrive at the same decision and at the same time. That's what we spoke about yesterday. We said the ideal way, the ideal way is to cooperate and arrive at a decision together. Now when does that happen? That happens when you're what? <coughs> when you're intellectual. When you're using that intellect. He said, look at the, the IQ level. Look at the intelligence level. Okay? For you as well, sisters. Somebody propose? Ask about it. it doesn't, the degree does not matter, basically. 
What he studied does not matter. It's the intellect. Ask about it. Now, I ask you one thing sincerely, I'll let you know. And we, we derive this lesson as well from the incident that we just said. When Amir al Mumni approached and entered on his bride, he saw an incredible, beautiful woman. Why? Because he basically did not put beauty as number one priority. When you put beauty as number one priority, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prescribes it very beautifully. He says, Man tazawwaja imra'atan Whoever marries, whoever picks, chooses a spouse because she's beautiful or because he's handsome or because he's wealthy or she's wealthy, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala won't, won't let you enjoy that wealth or that beauty or that handsome man anymore. Haramahullah min jamali. You won't get to see that. I don't know why you look out the outer beauty, brothers and sisters. Because you will, after a certain time, you'll get used to it. I ask you, if you eat your same favorite food every single day, after a while, is it going to be your favorite food? Your favorite meal? No. If you, let's say, Watch your favorite movie every single day. After a year, I need to ask you, is that movie going to stay the, si the same single, the same favorite movie? No. Now basically your wife and your husband, you're going to see him every single day in your face. Right? Every single day when you wake up, he's going to be beside you. Right? You're going to see that face every single day. So you're going to get used to it for a level. So when you look at the inner beauty, let's say, La Allah, God forbid, if you got married from a beautiful man, woman because of her beauty, and after a while, she, let's say, got into an accident, and her face got disfigured. What are you going to do? You're going to look at the inner beauty. What if she did not have inner beauty? For you as well, sisters. When it comes to you as well, So, من تزوج امرأة لمالها أو جمالها حرام الله Don't put that as 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 okay. Look for something acceptable. I'm not asking you. I was speaking once to one of my friends. He's like, but Sheikhna, I I don't want to marry a soldier. I told him, no, you're not gonna marry a soldier. <laughs> no, something acceptable. Okay, don't don't marry a soldier, but something acceptable. Okay? For a level of being, but don't put it in number one priority. Never ever. If you put it in number one priority, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will definitely fail. You will definitely fail. Now have that list, basically. When you have that list, it will become really easier. Now, the third aspect is where Al Imam says that I need that woman from that family which is known by its courage that virtue particularly that he wanted that courage that he saw that he wanted for his own purpose is in the family okay not in his son what does that mean that mean Amir al 1400 years it's explaining the what the law of what genetics genetics right subhanallah is a Genealogy. Amir al-Mu'min Ali Abdul Salatu Wasalam says that there are some sort of virtues who will pass down to your children. That's why I need a courageous woman so my son can be courageous. Now that's basically giving us half of let's give it that's completing half of the job. If you want, let's say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant you with a religious son then you have to pick a religious husband. And if you want, let's say, a pious son, then you have to basically pick a pious woman. 
and vice versa as well. If la Allah, God forbid, you know that let's say that husband that you are accepting on has a history of, God forbid, let's say sin. That sin will what? Pass to your children, to your progeny. Ever heard about Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al-Thaqafi? That ruthless murder? Do you want to take a look at his family for a second? The story tells us that one of the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that had become a successor as well. That man was wandering around in the, in the neighborhoods of Medina. He hears a lady fantasizing on a one man saying, Laytali sabilun ila Amr ibn Hajjaji. I wish I could meet Amr ibn Hajjaj. And she's fantasizing in the middle of the night. Seems like he basically got jealous for an extent. He's like, why is she fantasizing on that man? Who's that man? Next day, in the mosque, masjid, he says, Aina Amr ibn Hajjaj. Grab me Umar ibn Hajjaj right now. I need to see him. They bought him. It turned out he was extremely handsome. For a level, he was very, very, very handsome. He looked at him. He told him, why are you handsome? He says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created me this way. He's like, okay. Umar ibn Hajjaj had long hairs. Long, blonde hairs. That's what the uh, narration tells us. So that successor ordered to shave off his hair. He told him you have to shave off your hair. Now what's funny is, after shaving off his hair, he turned more handsome. So he told him, I need to send you out to Basra. You're not going to stay in Medina. He sent him out to Basra. Okay. Now that woman, which was fantasizing, fantasizing about Amr ibn Hajjah, nar narration tells us, that she married Yusuf al thaqafi Okay? And they got granted with a son called Al Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al thaqafi which was a ruthless murderer. He killed millions of people. Umar al Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al thaqafi Now, when speaking about Abu Fadl al Abbas, والسلام, we're definitely speaking about courage. But not being reckless, not the wide courage where you lose control of. La, the Fadl Abbas knows when to use his courage. When he was in Safin, narration states that Abdul Fadl Abbas was a young man, was a youth, not even not even 15 years old. When Muawiyah was sitting beside a brave warrior that time on the enemy side called Ibn Sha'tha, he told him, Ibn Sha'tha, I know that you have seven sons. Can you send one of them to, to the battle right now? He said, yeah, definitely. He says, my sons, each, of, each warrior of my children is compared to hundred men. He told him, okay, so send them. He sent them. And then a brave young man walks out from the tent of Ali ibn Abi Talib, peace be upon Allah. Muawiyah told him, Ya ibn Shahtha, are you going to change your mind? He told him, why? He's like, what do you mean, why? This man came out from the tent of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He told him, even though that young man engaged in, engaged into a fight with the first son, he finished him. Narration states, with the second son, he finished him. With the third one, he finished him. And the fourth, all up to the seventh. And then Ibn Shahsa told Muawiyah, I am going to basically take revenge for my kids. And he came down, and that young man finished Ibn Shahtha. People wanted to know, who is that man? Ali ibn Abi Talib came to him, told him, Amit Lithamak, 
He took off his mask or his scarf and it was Al-Abbas ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Oh, Muhammad, Ali, Muhammad. He told them, Bunayya, udkhul ilal khayma, go inside the khayma. Akhafu alayka min al-ayn. He's afraid. This is something basically real. When I'm speaking about ayn, okay? It's something real. He told him, Innaha tunzilu al-rajula fil qabr. The words of Amir al-Mu'mineen told him, Ayn sometimes would basically drop that man into his grave right away. And drop a whole camel into a pot. Now, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, brother and sister, after Karbala, I was reading a beautiful narration saying that when they bought the heads of Ahlul Bayt and Nabuwa, peace be upon them, to Yazid. Yazid was sitting down. He started questioning. Hada Rasuman, who's this head for? They told him, Hada Rasu Ali al Akbar ibn al Hussein. Allah. He said, Hada Rasuman. They told him, Hada Rasul Hussein ibn Ali. And then he said, Hada Rasuman. They told him, Hada Rasul Abbas ibn Abi Talib. Allah. And then he says, Akhbiruni kayfa kanat Karbala. Tell me, how was Karbala? How did you guys do there? Shimmer stood up saying that, Ya Amir, it was simple. It was something very simple. We basically finished them in a couple of hours. Another guy stood up saying that, Ya Amir, it was extremely easy. I mean, you know what I mean? 70 against 30,000. We completed them off. And then one man sitting at the end, kind of not comfortable with the situation. Yazid told him, uh, what's going on with you? Why you're not comfortable? Speak out. He says, Ya Amir, I, I, I want to speak, but I'm afraid. He's like, speak out. Tell me how it's Karbala. Allah. He told him, Ya Amir, لَقَدْ هَجَمُوا عَلَيْنَا بِخُيُولٍ جُرْدٍ مُرْدٍ جَبَلُ الْأَرْضَ بِدِمَائِنَا Ya Yazid, they basically attacked us, galloping on their horses, and they mixed our blood with the earth that time in Karbala. وَإِنَّ صَاحِبَ هَذَا الرَّأْسِ And he appointed to Abil Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam. He's like, this man, basically when he used to attack and strike the left side of the army, he used to flip it towards the right. And when he used to attack the right side of the army, he used to flip it to the, right, to the left. Allahu Akbar. وَلَوْلَ الْقَضَاءِ الْمُبْرَمِ لَفَرَّقُوا جَمْعَنَا وَشَتَّتُوا شَمْنَا Allah. And if it was not for the destination of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the 3,000 have been done. They could have killed us. They could have finished us. That's Abil Fadl al-Abbas alayhim after the Narration states, brothers and sisters, that Abil Fadl al-Abbas, when he basically went toward the battlefield, he was not going there to fight. And he was basically asked, by Imam Hussein to go and grab water. But you know that the enemy was creating sort of a barrier between the river and between the tents of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. So Abbas alayhi salam had different attempts to go and bring the water. And he bought the water, narration states. But on that time, when Ali al-Akbar, Ascended to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Hussain says, I still have my backbone, Abil Fadl Abbas. When Qasim left, he still said, I have my backbone, Abil Fadl Abbas, Ruhi al -Fida. The one who carries my banner. But brothers and sisters, when he came towards him asking for permission to fight, he told him, Mallim niswati ba'daka ya Abil Fadl. If you go, Women, as soon as they look at you, they feel comfort. 
As soon as they see you without doing nothing, they feel comfort, Abu al-Fadl. Where are you going? You're the one who bought them to Karbala. You are the one who's responsible to take them back to Medina. And then he gave him permission. He told him, go, basically. Bring water if you want. Al-Abbas. Ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib, peace be upon him, heads towards the battlefield. He galloped, he started galloping towards the battlefield. He opened, split the army, and he reached the river. Al Abbas alayhi salam comes down to the bank of the river and he touches the water. He basically starts speaking to the water. How cold are you, O water? Then why are you preventing yourself? And Ruqayya is thirsty. Why are you preventing from yourself from Sukaina? She's thirsty. Zainab is thirsty. His heart was turned into a basically heat into fire. He remembered Hussein alayhi salam and he starts shedding tears. He actually basically left the water there and he stood up. This is the tradition of Iraq. This is the Turaf of Iraq. These and these abiyat, what they call them abiyat. The poet Ibn Nasar, he, this abiyat, these poetry have to be recited in every majlis in Iraq. <laughs> is standing in the door of her tent looking at Imam Hussein. She looks at the expression of his face. If she sees Imam al Hussein, sort of okay, she feels that Abbas is still alive. As soon as she sees Hussein frown, he knows that something danger, danger has happened to Abbas alayhi salam. She tells her, Akhi Hussein, mal khabar, tell me what's going on. I see you different right now. She tells her, Ruqayya Zainab, Azam Allah lak al Faqad quti'at kaffa bil fadl al Abbas. They have cut off his right hand. And then she basically asks him, what is going on? Tell me, Akhi Hussain. He tells her, Ruqayya Azam Allah lak al Say Hakim ibn al-Tufayl, that evil man, basically strike the left hand of Al-Fadl al-Abbas. Not raise anymore. How about Akhi Hussein? Can you help up? Can you send somebody to help me up? 
but the narration states that he embraced that banner towards his chest and he grabbed it with his own blessed teeth. And then Zainab السلام, keep looking to Hussein. Tells him, Abba Abdullah, Akhbirni, Mada Jarali Abil Fadl Abbas. He tells her, Zainab, Lakad Asab, Sahmun, Aina Abil Fadl. They have basically pierced his eye with an arrow. Aywa Abbas, Aywa Sayyida. tragedy uh, and another tragedy is when he tell when he sees Abu al al Abbas brothers and sisters uh, when an enemy is striking him from behind and that narration says that he's carrying an iron pole he smashed Abu al al Abbas on his head Like 
عرفت العذب لجلي وطلعت من النهار عطشان أو يرفز ذا أبل فضل عباس leaves the river and while he was thirsty يا أخوي قوت حيلتي وشمتت بي العدوان مدرح من على الجيم الأورد للخيم وانعاك يا بقوت حيلتي وشمتت بي العدوان مدرح من على الجيم Should I strike these enemies and take revenge or should I go back and protect the women's and the children Hussein عليه السلام goes back to the tent more minutes inshallah he sees Zainab alayhi salam she asks him why are you by yourself khuya wahdak jai liyana wahdak jai liyana cha abbas khuya al-butal wiyana where's abbas he tells her Zainab Before he leaves, he gave me that farewell. Zainab Abbas السلام, sends his salam to you and he apologizes. He says that he did not know that he's going to die there. His mission was to grab the water. <laughs>